Hello everyone, uh, my name is Alessandro Petti and um, I'm an architect, I'm an artist and together with Sandy Lal we established DAR that stands for Decolonizing Architecture, Art uh, and Research and um, our projects are situated between art, architecture and, um, and activism and today we will talk more about uh, specifically one of the projects that's um, around the stateless heritage that is an exhibition that is taking place here at the Mosaic Room. Uh, hello, my name is Sandy Lila. Um, I'm, I co-founded uh, DAR with Alessandro Petti. We are uh, partners both in life and in uh, work and indeed DAR also in Arabic means home. And since we began working together, we have been uh, always feeling as if the, the discussion that we are bringing sometimes is lacking in the public. You know, when we went back to Palestine and we wanted to understand what does it mean to link decolonization and architecture and decolonization and art, we felt that the only place where from where we can departure was our house and our living room. And indeed, we turn it into a place for conferences and we opened up a residency uh, for architects and artists when we turn our house into the place from where to begin to discuss uh, decolonization in Palestine and and since then we have been always trying to find our ways around in which we create our own spaces in uh, through which we can uh, figure out what we have a lot of doubts about in uh, in our work so uh, um, I think, yeah, I mean, departuring from the living room has been always one of the points of departure of our practice. And I guess the spirit of the conversations today, it, it is more uh, using the um, stateless heritage as a, as a point of discussion, um, as a sort of uh, case studies around subjugated form of heritage, the making of heritage, uh, or criteria that are applied to UNESCO, acquisitions, diff different topics that maybe uh, we can explore together. And it's a way that we invited in that um, not easy uh, situation three uh, speakers or three respondents. Um, and um, I would like maybe I will give them the, the, the mic to introduce themselves. Maybe we can start from uh, Anita and then Corina and then Robert, if you can please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anita Bakshi. I'm an architect by training, but I now teach in a landscape architecture department um, at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, I've been thinking about heritage and memory and memorials for, for many years, and, and especially in terms of how um, that uh, how to think about that or how they operate in divided contexts when histories and memories are, are challenged or viewed from different perspectives and angles. Um, a few years ago, I published a book, Topographies of Memories, in which I think through different ways of engaging with heritage and uh, different forms that the memorial might take. Thank you. Hi, I'm Corinna Gardner, and it's an absolute delight to be here. I work at the Victoria and Albert Museum, also in London and um, work with contemporary product and digital design, but largely run also a programme called Rapid Response Collecting, which is about bringing items into the museum at the time when they are the subject of popular and critical discussion and conversation. Um, my work looks at an, an expansion of the definition of design, and we might translate that today to an expansion of the definition of heritage. Um, I'm also keen to explore the notion of monopolies on expertise, um, and authenticity or value structures and how the institutional context, UNESCO or read a national collection um, can be leveraged and thought about differently to enact and empower um, global majority voices. Hi, my name is Robert Marle. I'm an architect and an academic. Um, I hold academic posts in the UK, Sweden and Turkey and my research and teaching is around how issues of the informal and identity identity maintained by displaced populations can be understood and used as a way of questioning, I suppose, the formal orthodoxy of the humanitarian sector that is based so often on utility. Um, part of that is um, an educational initiative I helped found called the Global Free Unit, where we have live project classrooms in many, many contexts around the world, where students, participants, 
um, volunteers work together to do things that are useful. And we currently have classrooms that are dealing with issues of displacement in the UK, on the south coast, in Colombia, um, and particularly in Turkey and Izmir. So I'm really here to discuss and explore how some of the tactics that I so admire um, in the exhibition might be operationalized together within some of the work that we do. Wonderful, thank you for your uh, introduction. And um, maybe I would just also like to thank you for accepting um, to be part of these conversations and the Mosaic Rooms for organizing and the Architectural Foundation also for uh, broadcasting this um, uh, video and these discussions today. Um, and the spirit, as we said, to um, have rather a conversations and a way to, to think together um, aspect of the project, but also how the specific approach that we use uh, in the World Heritage Nomination dossier for the Hesher refugee camp and the 44 villages can be applied also uh, to different um, situations of uh, subjugated form of heritage or minority heritage. That maybe is something that we can do um, by um, showing you just a very short eight minute video so that we don't uh, um, spend too much time in, in presenting you the, the project specifically. And we hope that that is a way to just enter directly into the conversations and give us a little bit more space then to go back and explain some of the aspects, but also hopefully in this eight minutes video also with some images, I think it might help um, to start to, to just start the conversation. Do refugee camps have history? This was the fundamental question at the base of the nomination of the Hesha refugee camp as UNESCO World Heritage Site. Refugee camps are established with the intention of being demolished. They are not accepted to have a history or a future. They are meant to be forgotten. The history of refugee camps is constantly erased, dismissed by states, humanitarian organizations, international agencies, and even by refugee community themselves in fear that any acknowledgement of the present undermines their right of return. The only history, in fact, that is recognized within refugee communities is one of violence, suffering, and humiliation. How then we understand the life and the culture that people built in camps, despite suffering and marginalization? The photo that you see here are part of the UNESCO dossier produced in over two years of discussions with refugee communities, local residents, heritage experts and cultural producers. Members of the camp strongly expressed their fear that the nomination would change the status quo and threaten to undermine the legally recognized right of return. At the same time, many expressed their desire to see refugee history being acknowledged in an attempt to bring back the right of return at the center of the political discussion. We were interested here in documenting the life, the spaces and the political structures that emerged in almost seven decades of exile. Palestinian camps are not made any more of tents, 
They are complex urban structure, and we don't have the right vocabulary to understand and describe this forced condition of permanent temporariness. In understanding today's refugee condition beyond the humanitarian crisis, refugee heritage traces, documents, reveals, and represent refugee history beyond the narrative of suffering and displacement. خلدة قطرة التينة القسطينة تل الترمس الفالوجة عراق المنشية القبيبة الدوايمة بيت جبرين بيت نتيف علار خربة التنور راس أبو عمار القبو بيت عطاب سفلة بيت محسير الشوع عسلين صرعة عرطوف دير رفات دير الهوى لفتة دير ياسين عين كارم المالحة سطاف صوبة خربة اللوز كسلة دير عبان الجورة زكريا البريج كدنا ذكرين دير الدبان دير الشيخ جرش مغلس عجور الولج These are the names of the villages of origin of which Palestinians were expelled and now reside in the Hesha refugee camp. Israel demolished more than 300 villages in 1948 in order to prevent Palestinians from returning to their homes. Today, only a few public buildings like schools, mosques and cemeteries are standing as material evidence to the expulsion of the Palestinians. Today, these villages have for the most part been substituted with exclusive Jewish-Israeli towns, national parks, and industrial areas. Refugee camps and villages of origin are associated with the same history of displacement and disposition. They are both in legal limbo and suspended. On the one hand, the camp is a permanent temporary space of emergency carved out of the state sovereignty. While on the other hand, the village is legally defined by the Israeli state as absentee property. Despite their geographical separations, the two sides clearly have direct links and connections. Therefore, we see the possibility and the urgency of nominating the Hesha refugee camp and the 44 villages of origin as a serial, transboundary World Heritage Site according to the UNESCO World Heritage Site criteria.
No, I mean, I was thinking that maybe it would be nice also to, uh, after this video, take you a little bit through the exhibition in the mosaic room that is made uh, of three different uh, sections. The first one entering uh, the museum on uh, in, entering the mosaic room is a, is a room that contains uh, light boxes of the life in the night in the Haitian refugee camp. And actually, we uh, dur during the process of the exhibition, we commissioned the photographer Luca Cabuano that has been previously commissioned by UNESCO to make photos for the Italian uh, sites, for uh, the Italian recognized UNESCO sites. And we asked him to come to Dehesha and make the photos in the same exact monumentality care that he used for the same Italian uh, uh, site, right? And then Luca Cabuano came and in discussion together with him, we were explaining how sometimes we feel frustrated that camps are only photographed to, during the day with kids inside and in maybe the worst part of the of the camp as a way to show the miserable life refugees are living in and we have been always uh, feeling that the night in the camp has never been really captured the life in the camp in, 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 during the night is not uh, uh, what what photos normally capture so we encourage uh, Luca to make these photos in the night and then the, the viewer will go through these light boxes and and actually go into the details of, of the camp in the night and then on the uh, first floor actually going through stairs and we wanted this very strong physical experience the viewer would go from the Haitian refugee camp to the 44 villages of origin and indeed by doing that that the trajectory in in the in the gallery he is the viewer is making something that Palestinian refugees cannot do in this historical moment of their life. Even if their villages are a few kilometers far away from the camp, they can walk a few hours to reach their villages, yet they are unable to reach it. So we wanted very much the viewer to be able to actually move between uh, these two places. And then we end up in this living room where we're sitting and where we decided actually to create a living room to host in London for the period of the exhibition, uh, the, the, the discussion around stateless heritage and, and how we understand today uh, heritage through the lenses of uh, seven millions of refugees and stateless people and people that also not only legally stateless, stateless but the people people that feel in this moment not represented by their state. So what kind of heritage we can uh, carry. And uh, we, this living room was a result of an open call where we asked people in diaspora and stateless people to loan some of the objects they have in their living rooms as a way to share with, uh, with the public. And, and indeed, we ended up with so many nice pieces from Gaza, from Egypt, from the Middle East, and from many, many parts of the world where people contributed into making this uh, uh, public uh, living room that will be active with a very intense program during the period of the exhibition in the mosaic room. Uh, so I wanted only to, to take you in the exhibition as, as a way also to experience and understand that for us, the physical experience of the exhibition is, plays a, a very important role in our uh, works. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm interested in this idea of exhibition making and art as a political act or one of agency and action and indeed protest and I wonder how you feel the voices of those that you represent who are in the camp and cannot leave the camp, how they feel and engage with the work that you do. That sense of the poly polyphony of this process is something that I'm eager to understand more of, particularly as I think of the context of the institution and the museum. Yeah, actually, indeed, this is a, a very interesting uh, uh, point of the project. Because when we began to discuss, it wasn't our first project in the camp. We have been there for many years before arriving to this. This is one of the last almost projects we did in, in the camp. We, at the beginning, we established a, a university in a refugee camp because we felt the need actually to begin to understand what is it that we are uh, witnessing and then it designed a concrete tent, tried to save some of the shelters that remains in the 50s and 
the thing. And as a reaction to this, we arrived to a point where we thought about the nomination of UNESCO. And when we began to think about this with the camp inhabitants, with some, some lead, political leaders in the camp, they were very worried, and, and we were very worried too, right? Because it also, we did not understand how this has would have an implication on the camp, and how can we understand the right of return in that sense. And at the beginning, the first process, we were speaking only about the camp, but throughout the process, then the 44 villages came out as a serial nomination. So we were all very worried. And indeed, one of the things that we all agreed upon is that the best way to go through this project is by creating an art project out of it before everything. And it, it is very much related to a, a feeling that this story that we are creating in this moment has no space in the real political life and using the exhibition to create a space for this story and not only to use it in order to invite experts from UNESCO, local community, researchers and many people to discuss the nomination and make out of it a book and, and take seriously all the UNESCO nomination as part of it has been the only way that we all agree that this is maybe the place where we can be uh, political disobedience without hurting the, the, the community with whom we are working, especially when they are vulnerable communities. It's very important to understand that art might provide that space where artists are the main ones taking the responsibility in the good and in the bad, but in many ways they open up for a possible uh, uh, crack in the system where we can discuss what is impossible to be discussed in this historical and political moment we are living in. Can I just follow up um, on that with a, um, another question? In the film, I found it very powerful. Um, first, I didn't understand what I was looking at. There were images of, of landscapes and fields and, and, the, and the voiceover, and then I came to understand that these are the names of the um, Palestinian villages that were destroyed. Um, and so sometimes it's, it's a landscape, it's a new settler neighborhood, it's ruins of a village. And that made me think about how, um, how these spaces as they currently exist can be read or be made legible. And I imagine that's quite different for um, the communities who were expelled and displaced from these places and then the, the public that today is living in those um, what, what is read as just like a beautiful landscape or a field or even a new peace forest that's been planted or your village or your, your suburban home that you know and grow up in. Um, and it, it seems like there's such important work to be done to make that legible um, in contrast to what the landscape or the built environment is kind of telling us the, the place is about. So how have you engaged with that, um, with that um, audience that is not those who are rooted and connected to the places that have been um, eradicated, but to the people living there now. Is that part of um, your effort through this exhibition or any of your other work um, previously in the camp? Yeah, um, I guess one of the maybe difficult part and challenging part of, of the of thinking about nominating the Haitian and the 44 villages of origin was since the beginning that somehow was destabilizing uh, certain kind of uh, you know categories of uh, what is understood as, as a camp and if, even if the camp could have values but also at the same time um, was destabilizing maybe also a romantic idea of um, the villages in the 1948 so for us, the priority was also to have first and foremost a critical, uh, fundamental conversation with the, the Haitian community to start with. Uh, and that you know, took several years, of course, and that is where actually what Sandy mentioned before, um, art for us become the only space where very loaded political conversation could happen. Um, in this case, also a space that, for example, through the, the images of the actual status of those villages were very difficult to digest 
for people in Asia. Because you know, without those images, the discussions about return, that which is a, a political international right inscribed in international law and human rights law, um, were always framed as a, a going back to a past, going back, you know, to the village in 1948. And somehow there are two parallel negation in this kind of uh, discourse. And on one side, there is a negation of the actual status of, of, of this, that is the only pragmatic political ground around which one can really imagine any possible return and how to do it practically, not only if this happens, but for us was shifted the conversation and say how this could happen. But at the same time, the other aspect has been always negated, in this case also within refugee community themselves, is also the other very painful questions, what is going to happen to the camp? Because you know, one of the things, of course, Palestinians recognized was always, of course, the uh, beginning of the Nakba in 1948 and the continuation of the Nakba, because you know, the demolitions is happening as, you know, is happening and the invasion and the destructions is, it's not ended, so we are not talking about post-conflict situations. You know, we are still facing, you know, the same, um, uh, the same thing. You know, that demolished these houses in 1948. Now, you know, is in Gaza and in other places in Jerusalem, etc. So, in this case, was also to through and through only a a fictional, real condition of of an art project. The community would be allowed to speculate. You know, to push certain kind of dominant understanding of how also to think about return, you know? So for us, um, was was much more to, to sparkle this very fundamental conversations that then become very much also about how, how to think about return, how to think about in this, maybe the larger discourse of restitutions, for us was also thinking about the return also as a form of, of restitutions, you know, to this land. But in order to do that, we also wanted to be very uh, pragmatic um, to, to really look at the, at the two reality and try to understand that thinking about the return without also thinking about not only the actual present state of this land, but also the condition of exile, you know, and asking these questions, how, you know, the exile inform any possibility of return. Because of course, what we many times in our difficult conversations, what we do know, and I think this now has been historically proven, that if we think about return only within the frame of a nation state, we will face always the same problem, you know, in which there will be constantly somehow, or at some point, you know, a minority, of course, that will be excluded and part of the people will be excluded. What for us, I think, is important in the project that open up also a different understanding where people actually, they don't have to, to, to decide if, is it the camp, the reality of the camp or the reality of 1948, but you know, how you can belong to places at the same time. And that is actually what we hope that the, the most maybe important political dimension of the project is to push people to think, how come we are not able to think today a political reality that allowed people to, to belong to more than one place at the same time? How come that we have to fix that into a nation state structure that is collapsing everywhere, that is continue to produce violence, it continues to pro produce civil war because it's inscribed, you know, in this idea of negating the rights of minorities. So for us, in a way, it's much more articulating that as, as, as a question that can only answer collectively what could be a political organization that doesn't prevent people, you know, to live, for example, in two places at the same time and thinking about return only as a returning back to, to an individual nation state based uh, and, and specific side that is most of the time very nostalgic. And this were first and foremost conversations that were uh, within Palestinian communities. Thank you. I mean, I, I hadn't seen the section of, of the ruined villages, the demolished villages. And um, I suppose it was very powerful and interesting for me. I, I've witnessed the sort of forced demolition of two camps, the, the Cali jungle, which was forcibly um, demolished and in fact when it was demolished all of the civic buildings the churches and schools were left in, in a in a gesture that's very reminiscent of, of, of the situation observed in your film and more recently the burning down of the Moria camp in Lesbos 
And I suppose what, what your film did so beautifully was to um, enter into this cycle of um, the creation of a camp of place and its demolition and seem to point to the demolished villages as both a site of memorialization, but also as a very, very powerful question of what is future occupancy? What is the nature of the urbanism and architecture of resettlement or return or in fact um, integration? So I felt that sense of, of, of being drawn into an almost endless cycle really powerful in the way in which the film was um, presented and led to questions for me about the situation in, in, in Lesbos at the moment um, in a way that I think is very powerful. Yeah, I guess maybe one aspect that I think was interesting, Robert, um, that you brought up that was a very important lesson also for us is it when, especially when the camp are demolished, that then we realize in some way the values that actually the camp has. You know, before that moment, for example, the destruction of Nahar al Barents was at this very important moment, you know, in which people wanted to rebuild Nahar al Barents, you know, that was incredible, powerful um, uh, community based actions, you know, to rebuild Nahar al Barents. And, and that will, in some ways, also shows, you know, that that are not simply any more uh, non spaces. Or, space without any values and i think that's in fact in, in, in a small scale as sandy we're anticipating this project emerged also from uh, our attempt to preserve some of the first um, plots that contains in the camp shelters from the 50s etc and, and and those that kind of process at some point the one of the member that, that extended large family member decided actually to demolish those and I think that's part of this conversation actually about um, the value of, 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 of those buildings. So in, in a way, there is always this moment that we understand the, the importance about those places, unfortunately, only when you know, they are uh, erased or partially demolished in some ways. You know? So in a sense, this, I think that is a little bit what also we were trying to um, to push the conversation forward, you know, to uh, not waiting simply the, the total, you know, demolitions or, or, or this bigger questions about what to do with the camp, but start that conversation from now, because we believe that through that conversation, then the possibility of return, the possibility of understanding what are the values that needs to be preserved, then at some point they shift completely. So they are not somehow left, you know, uh, not uh, explored. And I think that that dimension was for us a very, fundamental dimension. I think that's absolutely powerful because talking primarily as an architect, when you're faced with the, the prospect of what is the architecture and urbanism of the return, and I use that in every sense, or um, relocation to another temporary condition, where does one look to for an architecture and urbanism that carries the vitality and the horror of the temporary but can actually utilize that to make a better environment and i think within the um architecture and and um qualities of the camp that your exhibition characterizes one is defining a language and, and maybe in that sense i would like actually to add um one very important point the return is is most probably one of the words that is the most used in a place like Palestine, right? The right of return and the return and what return might um, ever mean. And I guess that it is not only within a Palestinian context, you know, the word return is very much belonging to us as humans, right? What does it mean to return? What does it mean to belong to somewhere? What does it mean to belong to more than uh, one place and, and how Maybe it also will, uh, uh, I, I would bring return and integration as, as two very important terms together. And, and indeed, maybe in this, the Haitian refugee camp or more, all Palestinian refugee camps refuse to be integrated and settled where they are as a, way, as, as a, as a political strategy to say, we do not want to be integrated here. We do not 
want to settle here because we want to come back home. And, and this was one of the most political and still one of the most political strategies that Palestinians are still very outspoken about. But, but I think that in that sense, it's very important to understand. Indeed, we, we believe that this project is not only about the Hitler refugee camp and the community in the Hitler refugee camp. It's way more to understand that camps is part of the, the human heritage we are dealing with right now. All of us, all of us has to do with uh, the word return. All of us has to do with the word belonging. How many of us is, is not changing the sofa in his living room because maybe next year I will not be living in the same place where we are living and, and, and all the time looking forward for the other step to come. And, and we are using the example of the Haitian refugee camp because it is one of these sites in the world right now that actually make a political action out of I do not want to accept settlement in that sense. And, and this will make, and why they did not want to accept to settle, because in our world where we are living right now, there is no room for two homes in the same time, right? So refugees were so afraid that then everybody would see that their home is the Haitian refugee camp, and they refuse this home because they belong somewhere else. And this will oblige, this is in, in somehow is obliging us to understand what does it mean today? What kind of political scenarios? How can we understand the community today? Not only specifically community in the sense of people living inside the history of Japan, but all of us is part of this community questioning. How can we today think about possible ways where we can belong in more than a place simultaneously and we are, we are not obliged by our states to choose and therefore to actually delete part of one side of who we are because we have to belong in one specific place. Right? So I think that the Haitian is very much and the nomination is very much about bringing these concepts back there and revise them and think about them and, and learn from a community like the Haitian on how we understand a different, a different politics. The failure actually of, of what happens in the Haitian should be for all of us a reason of why to think what is other alternative political scenarios. Yeah, thank you, um, Sandy, for ex explaining it or, or laying it out in that way, the impossibility uh, uh, given to us in our world of, of having two homes at once or belonging in one place. It just reminds me back to uh, taking back to the intro um, that you wrote to the book with your discussion of um, authenticity. And I felt just in what you were saying, there's an obsession with authenticity and also purity that one can only be um, a, a, a from one extraction or the other. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how your uh, living room project is gonna operate because I, I agree there's a lot, um, <clears throat> all communities in, in, in a whole bunch of different situations have to pull from and draw from that. Um, you'd also mention in the text that um, maybe it's embodied in the living room project that this idea of this perpetual transformation um, can maybe pull us out of how we view um, sort of this very frozen and static sort of definition of authenticity. Um, I've written a little bit about heritage practices and, and memorial practices sort of engaging in, in different registers through, um, you know, the importance of place, but looking that through um, actions, performances, um, different community groups sort of coming together as a way in which the heritage of a place can be, in, um, can have different meanings to like the community, which is never a monolithic thing, but it always has these different perspectives and how um, it can engage in ways that are meaningful to different ages within the community or different viewpoints, um, different ways of seeing the same place. Is that how the, the living room is, is meant to operate? I know you said people are bringing objects from, that are meaningful them for different places and you're having conversations there. Is that a way that you're trying to, to, to break through that, that static definition of what's authentic? Yeah, I, I think that the living room is, is uh, and I, ha I guess it has a, uh, almost a very 
strong connection with this uh, whole idea of authenticity because it also questions very much who is the guest and who is the host in that particular moment, right? And in, indeed, what, what we bringing the Haitian refugee camp back to the West, especially because we moved our bodies to Sweden at a certain point. And we realized that in, in somehow what is taken by refugees the moment they arrive to a place like Europe is their right to be host. And they are required always to be guests. Something that the Haitian has been carrying a lot is like, because if I would become a host, then I forgot my, I am, I'm not anymore a guest in that place. And because this whole notion of integration is that you should behave as a guest, you should stay always as a guest because your home is somewhere else. This was exactly the impossibility of having two homes. So the Living Room Project is demanding the right to be a host. And in, indeed says that as humans, we need both to move constantly between being hosts and guests. Otherwise, if we are imagining and perceiving ourselves only as hosts, we have a very strong colonial mind, means that we want only to be followed. And if we are, we accept our best only as the guest, means that we accept the oppression that that home is somewhere else and we should always behave as guests. And, and you know, in all cultures, among them in the Arab world, is you are guest, you are respected guest for three days. After that, you are not respected anymore because in, in some house in, in the Arab world, we say you begin to be a, you know, people host you because they have pettiness for you, because they are, um, they feel sorry about you and not because there is a mutual respect. And from the fourth day, you become a neighbor, right? And, and you stop to be only a guest. And I believe that in Europe, with the whole colonial framework, this guest has been brought forever as a way to maintain dominance in, 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 in who is hosting, both in private and in public, right? So I think that the living room in, in this exhibition wants to a little bit challenge who is hosting whom and who are the organizations that has the right to host uh, uh, discussion on heritage or less discussion on heritage. And the moment that we claim ourselves as hosts, of this discussion in a place like London, it is a little bit challenging, the public institutions, the public space, and the public notion around heritage, because what we say is that we self-elected ourselves as public hosts, right? And, and we open up the living room, and we demand to be hosting this discussion in, uh, in uh, and we are inviting people to come in, and not, not only us, by the way, because each Sunday, the living room would be hosted by uh, Omar Hida from the Haitian refugee camp that found himself doing a master in London. He wants to stay further. He has been collaborating with us in the project and he is opening the public living room and, and have a, a Sunday for connection every day, every Sunday with the Haitian refugee camp, open it to the public to be part of it and to be, I guess it is one of these ways not to be passively proposing certain ideas, but to activate them constantly. And this is where, where I say, you know, we create the story, yes, and we maybe challenge the frame, yes, but we also pretend to activate our own story, right? It's not only to tell them, not only to, uh, you know, um, have the, the, the storytelling side, but also the story activating side for us become extremely important because it is where we feel agent, where we feel empowered to change, where we feel the art can shift certain things and, and as if we are inhabiting, we decide to inhabit our own stories as, as a matter of fact. And, and maybe to return back to the authenticity part, I think that it also the, in the same way clashes with the idea of having more than a home simultaneously because when you are required to be authentic, this is a very specific requirement to choose one home and to prove even that you are part of that one home, right? So I think that it should make all of us think, what does it mean? How not to be guests forever and, and how not to obey to certain frameworks and even, and, and but never to give up with these frames because I think this, the, there, in, in there where the struggle is taking place. So to demand to be a host, is to, me, to demand to be in that frame, but to change it, right? So in, in many ways, I think there is this very strong aspect in our practice that we believe it is at the core of 
how we understand art today. I'm fascinated by this notion of the demand of the project. I think it's a really welcome provocation. And clearly, one of those is with this desire for recognition of a particular status within the frameworks of UNESCO. And that is being enacted. But I'm interested to think about these other possible story endings or beginnings that you talk about. And what uh, it comes also to some of the questions that Robert, that you've been asking about myth making or tactics or narration, how we can use these powerful acts of creativity to think beyond. So within my orbit, we think about acquisition into a collection, but might it be more powerful and more appropriate and indeed a language that is more akin to this type of work, the placement in a collection, placement within an institution, within that then to leverage the frameworks of those institutions in different ways to give the credence, the authenticity, to then think again, to give another narrative or a different ending to projects such as these. Yeah, I guess for us, one striking moment, you know, when in our conversations, it was now about seven years ago, we, we started to think, what if the Haitia, you know, become like World Heritage Site and get recognized as something has value? I think what we witnessed, it was the, the urgency, you know, of, of recognizing something that has been dismissed by everyone. Is dismissed, you know, by nation states. It's dismissed by NGOs. It's dismissed by even the community itself, because in the moment that you recognize that reality, you know, will undermine maybe the possibility of the right of return. And NGO working, for example, in, in refugee camps, you know, and, and, and most of the participants of campus camps that, for example, were taking, you know, people in this tour in the camp, they realize how much they could only frame their life as a life of a misery. Now imagine someone that, you know, was, you are born in that condition. And this is the only reality that you know. And, and even that the people want to support you, you the only thing that is given to you is to simply somehow reaffirm that sort of uh, reality. So somehow for us, you know, um, tripling and, and, and putting the emphasis on also on this everyday aspect, uh, uh, life you know and how that are can be recognized in this case by unesco but as you rightly i think were pointing out that maybe institutions have an incredible power and responsibility i would say to really uh, recognize forms that fall under the, the radar for example of the criteria of unesco and i think in a way we force ourselves into this template, the World Heritage Site, and we didn't give up, despite we knew that it would not fit into that, because also we wanted to show how much is missing in on that frame. So by accepting that template was, was for us to you know, do two things at the same time. One, on one side was to destabilize the dominant category of what constitute heritage and how much we have to challenge you know, this Western notion of heritage. But also it was important for us to shift the conversation of what is the camp. And if, and if a camp is only a place of misery or could be actually recognized as, as a container of, um, of values. And what are those, those values? You know, what are the form of life and, and, and the practices that in a way need, need, to, be, uh, need to be preserved? And, and in a way for us, the, 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 play, the only place in which this conversation could actually um, um, take place is inside art institutions, uh, uh, institutions that somehow provide an umbrella and, and recognize that this discussion in itself actually has a certain value. And of course, the next step for the project would be really understanding how in, in the idea that a, a museum can actually help to preserve some of this value, have to preserve, you know, the the practices and help somehow to uh, to to recognize because I think that is the most I will say important part, part which is this call you know to to get your life recognized that your life is not just you know a series of tragic events of course you know we don't want to undermine you know that and we don't want of course to romanticize you know that condition but at the same time uh, there are several other aspects that somehow are 
um, are hidden, you know, or somehow are not discussed, but also importantly, how this opens up also um, and force maybe a museum to think about what is the task of a museum if, if it is not that of preserving those stories, these incredible stories that somehow otherwise would get lost. And therefore, the museum is forced to reinvent, as we did a little bit with the category of UNESCO, you know, what does it mean um, acquiring, collecting, placing, helping to reactivate those stories so that those stories, you know, would not get lost. Um, and I think that, that, and especially because these are all specific evidence in history that have their kind of temporary moment. We have the, you know, refugee crisis, and then, you know, one wave after the other, and this story somehow, and what is produced, um, most of the time is lost. So that is definitely something that we would be very much interested in, in understanding how we can share that responsibility. Because we, as, as artists, architects, and researchers, I think we, we put ourselves together with the community somehow to start that, but many times in this process we are left alone. And we would like to think that this is where actually institutions can step in and take the responsibility to think how to preserve those stories, how to preserve you know, what um, was understood as something that had values. I think it's what's really interesting about the conversation and, and Karina, what you're doing is that actually we are talking here about artifacts. We are talking about objects. We're not talking about music or culture or, or film. We're talking about uh, taking artifacts of different situations into a, into a collection. And I, I just wonder, I mean, mindful of the sort of story around the Blue House, which never managed to make it into your collection. Um, just what you feel in relation to this conversation, the, the potential of validating or giving artifacts the status of being equal partners to something taken from Pompeii or Pyston or uh, William Morris House and, and what the what the intention is there because I think it's really interesting to understand that and I suppose to be certain that it's not a they are not curiosities within that cultural um, panoply that they're actually equal partners to those objects? It's a very big question um, <laughs> and an interesting one. I suppose this, this idea of equal status, the contemporary in many ways within institutions such as the VNA, so very often has to compete and hold its value with that of the historic object where the passage of time has affirmed or disaffirmed its value. Um, I think with this type of project, I think the exploration needs to be of whose voices are being represented and brought into the collection. Do those conversations become arrested on accession into the museum? But actually, how do we leverage more powerfully the platform of the institution, that civic public space of discourse, to continue that conversation in a different way? I mean, my mind is immediately running to what is the object? I mean, of course, there is the work that the Mosaic Room exhibition so brilliantly exhibits, but that is an exhibition of a series of ideas, political acts, community voices, of materiality in a sense. It's materializing a problem. So the first answer would be to acquire the photographs, perhaps, but that's to do a disservice in a sense to the wider intellectual heft of the project and so the conversation has to start with the community in the same way that the project in itself to my mind started with the community and it's that brilliance of embeddedness that in a sense the museum is asking in acquisition in its best practice for that generosity to be extended and then there becomes an exchange of equals as to how that set of objects then has an agency within the collections of the VNA. I think that sense of status, um, the work that rapid response collecting and broader activities of the VNA have enabled is that at times the modest or the difficult object can, must, and does hold that same status as the much lauded and the splendid. And in a sense, there's a commitment to a contemporary history that is that of it in the round. And I think that is potentially a shift in museum practice, but also the broader understanding of value and culture and heritage as we're talking about it today, that sits in society broadly, 
the one that in which we are operating and we as museums and curators indeed as architects and creative practitioners are part of that same flux or context well that, that is a fascinating conversation for us in a way because it also relates to um, a moment in which we were discussing um, if this should be nominated um, according to criteria that emphasis on, on the material or immaterial aspects. Not so yet there's no these discussions, you know, and and of course in that discussions I think many uh, were saying how much in the Western understanding of of heritage, which is mainly the, the material aspects and and only more recently the material aspect, especially of non-Western culture, was also creating a sort of second category, you know, so that somehow Western objects can maintain, you know, their kind of materiality and superiority, and then the material become somehow maybe a, a place where to locate all, all the things that they will not have necessarily the, the, the material expression. So in that case of the Hesha, we actually insisted that we wanted to have both. I mean, first, because we, um, um, we believe that in thinking about the camps, you know, in a way, one also has to accept how this uh, distinction of material and material needs to be put into question, right? I mean, that's, that could be something that, um, without, of course, negating that sometimes there might be certain materiality that actually help to, uh, uh, to connect or help to have uh, something that look like somehow immaterial, but also somehow not to fall in, into that trap of typical museum of collecting objects. And that I, I definitely could be for us, you know, one of the, the problem that somehow everything then is reduced to, um, uh, to only somehow the installations and the objects. I think that was for us always a sort of um, excuse to gather things around, but for us it would be very important to think how uh, we preserve certain characteristics that we, for example, in the nomination, like the how the camp in itself is the place at the moment where you can experience you have an experience of going back to the 1948 in which somehow the, the camp itself is made by the different um community that by being together they preserve you know a certain understanding and a certain of practice for example of commoning that actually they don't exist anymore in other places so the question would be for an institution you know how I preserve that, how we preserve, you know, this, this Almasha, which is this, how the people understand the camp, not made by pu public and private property, because as you know, refugees, even though they build their own houses, they cannot own these houses legally. At the same time, the streets of the camp, they are not public. So when an institution approach, you know, this in terms of preservations and acquiring, also, this category suddenly collapse, and that is I, I like to, when Korean was making this more in terms of exchange, and how much the institution have the courage, you know, to also challenge the categories that is approaching, um, you know, an issue like that, you know, and how much would be open to say maybe instead of uh, using you know our categories that still divide material and material or, or or acquisition in terms of objects, you know, what does it mean? Um, instead of acquiring, I would say, preserving certain practices of supporting the existence of, of certain practices somehow. No? So that, that is something that to me is fascinating because it's also tied very much to the broader discussion about decolonizing museum, you know, and in a way how important it is that we have to build a, a different vocabulary that speaks much closer to the actual things that we are doing instead of maybe um, using all the categories that might actually end up in, um, yeah, in, in even extracting things rather than actually supporting and, and preserving as it might be maybe the, uh, the intention. Yes, indeed. And that challenge of the category or, I mean, the museum has a history that predates UNESCO by some and it's kind of value and power structures are also those that in the contemporary we must wrestle with and challenge and it's exactly this type of project 
that brings some of those questions to the fore. Um, at the VNA, we are the National Museum of Design, so architecture, photography, the methods and modes that you use in your practice feel comfortable. Social history, ooh, becomes a much more immediate and perverse challenge. Um, and how do we think about actually in the here and now, you might say that context is the primary medium of creative practice. So how does the museum of the 21st century come to its approach of collecting when context is what is representative of practice today? Um, it's not an answer that, or a question that we're going to find an answer for in this session, but I think your project and so many of the ideas and approaches that we're coming to in this discussion ask of us in this, and it's that questioning, that interrogative sense that I feel so keenly in our discourse today. I mean, I'm just thinking about another category of people we work with, um, and it is um, just like you to comment on it, whether the situation changes in terms of this discourse, if one's working with active and purposeful migrants, as opposed to those who are refugees by virtue of displacement, and how the attitude towards the sense of heritage and the preservation of heritage changes in relation to active migration. And I'm mindful of the people in the Calais jungle who were, in a sense, making representations of, of, of the culture on the other side of the channel as an act of, of, sort of willful um, investigation of a future identity whilst in transit and practicing that, that future identity. Yeah, I guess for us what we, in our work we felt was always important that despite that we in fact are, are trying to even re-inhabit um, and, and redefine you know, the, the category of refugees or, or, or migrants or all the categories that you know speak more about um, about these specific conditions was also how somehow it's possible to build an alliances between different um, conditions uh, without this, you know, erasing, of course, the, the different um, violence, you know, that one is uh, um, exposed to, of course, uh, in terms of um, uh, migration of, of, of being a refugee and not having the document, etc. So without, of course, you know, wanting to um, flatten that difference, but there is one thing that maybe, or, or, or at least one aspect that could be, that bring people together is how one in the category of the being a refugee or a migrant, but also I would say a citizen, doesn't feel represented by um, national state. Um, so I think that is something that, for example, could bring also, um, you know, someone that ha that uh, is is a citizen and enjoy you know certain rights and enjoy in certain uh, certain conditions, um, not only being in solidarity, but be, but be rather you know in alliances in understanding how to give space, how to preserve, you know, how to um, uh, engage in, in in different form of heritage that are not necessarily framed. As as a, as a nation state um, heritage, because you know that is a little bit the kind of what we are inheriting, you know, as as a, as a dominant discourse. That at the end, all different all the different forms always are under and fall, you know, under the radar because somehow the category itself are built, you know, in order to highlight a certain kind of uh, you know national understanding of what constitute uh, uh, constitute heritage. So that is for me also an important um, work that, that, that in a way how we, we can also engage with, with people that can enjoy right as a citizen, but and that would be, for example, you know, my case, 
having an, an Italian passport and enjoying, you know, certain freedom, but at the same time, you know, not being fully represented by, uh, by the nation state. That is the alliance that also brought me to be interested so much in, in refugee camps, because that were the crack that I felt were through which one can really understand what comes after or thinking beyond the, the official state and what needs to, you know, what needs to happen in order to, to have thinking and practicing that goes a little bit beyond that. So that's something that I hope that in, in some of the projects can actually do is creating this sort of alliance. So what, what is your what is your response to, to those initiatives and projects? You know, refugee nation, the refugee, the Olympic refugee team and so on, the appropriation of ideas of the nation state, but for a, dis, a global displaced population. I guess we have been in some of our meetings, in, we have been um, you know, asking this question, should be, who has the right, for example, to use this uh, now nomination dossier that we draft, who has the right to put it forward? Is it the Palestinian Authority and therefore we are back you know, into a, a sort of nation state? But of course, the 44 villages are today inside Israel and, and the camp itself is a space which is carved out from state sovereignty. So definitely it might not be that. Or is it maybe the, the, the stateless nation of now about 60 million of people that actually are under that category that can actually take this and demand that this is one of the several things that needs to be recognized because this condition of statelessness is actually increasing even more no however one of the fear that we have that we don't want to necessarily just simply mirror you know this the sort of un structure or un nation state categories you know that then we end up in somehow or building you know a, a category of stateless nations and this maybe could somehow um, you know solve but it's rather again doing always this double work which is by bringing these questions we really hope to shake a little bit, you know, the what seems a little bit solid and unchangeable, which is uh, which is the category themselves. And also, we always go back to this kind of uh, struggling that we did when we used the template, and we didn't give up with that idea because, you know, we felt that that is necessary to work within and and, and against the structure itself. That was the very difficult work that I guess we we need to do. So because it's not easy to say, ah. Oh, let us imagine what comes after that, you know, in terms of nation state, but it's rather how within the actual structure of, of the present, we can actually operate and, and, and try to experiment forms that can bring us, you know, um, beyond this, this very uh, categories that we are still uh, forcing to use and then working much more as we already started in a modest form in our conversations, questioning some of the vocabulary and the words that we use because we bring on, uh, you know, certain definition that implies certain practices. So one fundamental work should be also how we create a vocabulary that somehow open up, um, you know, a different understanding. And indeed, I want to add one, one very major point, I guess, for, for me is, is how the use of identity politics today is not mirroring a very, very colonial framework, right? And, and we just look at each other's culture and accept this as a matter of fact because for me this is simply mirroring a very colonial way of doing you know we should absolutely acknowledge and recognize dominant power structures but in that sense instead of simply uh, uh, to, I mean simply accepting that this is what is it and and become sort of uh, pointing at each other colors how is it ever possible to create other conditions where it is possible to join the struggle for all of whoever would like to join the struggle, right? I mean, in, in that sense, a lot of time I say I born Palestinians and, and have been trying to decolonize myself all the time, but I guess it's not right that decolonize, that first we have been colonized and then we are asked the task to decolonize the world, right? I think that decolonization should be a task for everyone of us no matter which kind of color we come from. And I think that the possibility to create platforms where it is possible not to be pointed at only through, from which is the community, are you from Dehesha or aren't you from Dehesha, 
is I think that the right of return in that sense is belonging to everybody in this world that believe in justice, right? In, in, in that sense, it's very important to understand who is the community that wants to come in and create a struggle in order for uh, 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 the right of return to become a reality, to become back on the, and not to say, no, this is the task that the Haitian refugee camp needs to do, right? Because it's first we exile them, and then we ask them to take the, the most difficult task of the right of return, right? So for me, it, it becomes way more clear that the community is not about a geographical sort of area, right? If we will return back there, it's again, we are collapsing again and again into the need to choose one home, into the need to say we are not from both places, into the need of deciding who is the state we belong to. But rather than, is there a possibility of thinking today a counter strategy against a, a, a dominant framework where we use other tactics? right where we being inclusive for many people that indeed wants to change this framework right in in which way we are able to create a broader community for us becomes at the base of indeed we created what we call a common assembly where we invited so many people to be part of of this dossier and to endorse this dossier and, and they are from not only from of course there are people from the Haitian refugee camp but way broader, Palestinian diaspora, the rest of the world diaspora, people that are not willing to accept the state heritage as the only heritage of the world. I mean, we have just a vast community, and this is maybe the alliances we speak about all the time. Is it possible to think the community in a broader way, in, in that sense, as a real way of changing the dominant framework, rather than to keep pointing at each other sort of identity and, and colors as the only way to counter the dominant uh, power that we are living in this moment uh, in, in our political uh, and, and social uh, world. That, that's such an important um, broader part of your project. Um, and, and I think a lot of other um, initiatives that are uh, underway right now and, and at the moment. And just Kind of linking back, I mean, this isn't really a question, but I just wanted to reference back to what I had asked you a little while earlier, which is about that audience. So, you know, it's it um, in the film with the images of the um, former Palestinian villages, which are now, they look like everything. If you were just to look at it without knowledge, it's a landscape, it's a swimming pool, it's um, a picturesque ruin. Um, and, and so I think to get at that um, larger, like go, to go beyond identity politics, and again, like the, the authentic or the pure categories, this home and that home, um, I, I, I love how your um, provocation in the World Heritage uh, application dossier takes the existing document and the existing framework and inserts into it this, um, this other um, site and application that calls all that into question. So I'm really interested in other ways that, that those questions can be put out there more broadly, not just to the people in the camps or the people of this particular racial or ethnic group, but to everybody to ask that question, like what documents are we including, who's deciding, whose story is being told, and understanding that um, these are questions that actually have the potential to link um, all of us uh, in this broader kind of coalition and questioning of these structures that have dominated how we frame the question um, in the first place. Um, so I just wanted to say that I, I, I'm very excited about um, that possibility and seeing how you're going to go with that carrying forward. I guess this is a very beautiful way to end, right? <laughs> it's almost also four o'clock. Um, and I really like to thank you for uh, taking this adventurous uh, conversations <laughs> and accepting to, to think together because you know that is where we are exactly now. So thank you very much. <laughs>